means looking beyond my community, my immediate, out my front door, and understanding how my actions impact the world at large. Hey there, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 414. Today, I'm joined by my guests, Shihan Chris Santillo and Renchi Holly Santillo. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts. I love traditional martial arts of all kinds, and I've trained in a bunch of them, and now I get the opportunity to talk to some of the best martial artists in the world and some of the most interesting people, and those aren't always the same thing. We bring you different sorts of stories and topics and interviews twice a week. On Mondays, we bring you an interview like this episode. On Thursdays, we tend to bring you some kind of focused topic discussion, maybe something personally for me, or maybe I talk to somebody else. But you can find every bit of it at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. If you head on over to Whistlekick.com, you're going to see everything that we make, and you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on every single thing over there, from our uniforms to our protective equipment, comfy sweatshirts, you name it. There's a bunch there, super cool stuff, so check it out. My guests today, Shihan and Renchi Santillo, are, as you might imagine, married, and they're in parking on this journey that I don't really want to ruin. I want to let them tell you about it because it's fascinating. And through the, our discussion of this journey, we learn about their relationship to martial arts, their relationship to each other, their family, the schools that they run, their goals, so much more. It's a powerful, fascinating discussion that, to be perfectly honest, is motivating me to make some changes in my life. And I hope that you have, if not a similar experience, at least an enjoyable time listening to the conversation. So here we go. Shihan Chris Santillo, Renchi Holly Santillo, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We're happy to, to be here. Good to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. That may be the longest uh, string I've, ha- I've ever had to use. It was almost, I almost needed a breath. They're using, <laughs> using two titles and two first names and two last names. I don't think we've done that before, uh, but that's fun. And of course, you know, so we've got we've got two same last names here. We've got a male and a female voice. Listeners are probably guessing, and they're they're guessing accurately. Would you believe that, it's a coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> we randomly found two guests that wanted to talk about the same thing, and they were willing to be in the same place at the same time. And and they're not married. No, no, I would not. I would not believe that with all of that. So. So am I am I assuming correctly in that you are you are married? We actually didn't confirm that before. We are started. married. And for okay. those students out there who didn't know that, we're married, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Early think, on think, in our career, we tried not to show that. We felt like it was really important for our professional relationship with the students to not show that. And um, yeah, some of them thought we had something going on on the side. It, it, yeah. But yeah, we're oh, married. Guys. That had weird implications. Uh, we, <laughs> we finally just said it's easier to be like, no, we've been married for, you know, for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other end of the dynamic. Of course, there are plenty of um, schools, and we actually did a, uh, an episode about dating within the martial arts school. And I, I caught some heat for it because uh, quite a few of my friends have married people that they not only trained with, but trained under. Right. Yeah. And there's just this mm-hmm. this whole dynamic and there's a long conversation. There's a lot of nuance that goes along with that. For sure. And yeah, a lot of people will will hide it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and there's and there's pros and cons, like you said. There certainly are. There absolutely are. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm so not gonna lie. I, I would I've I've always kind of wanted. I don't think I've ever dated anyone that I've trained with. Yeah. Some of our happiest memories as instructors are the ones where we a match made in the dojo, you know, a match made in the studio. It's like, well, yeah. yes, when it's a student and another student. Yes, right. to be fair. That's, that's, that's like, and when it works out. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's some well, someone got actually married in our studio. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, we yes. Were, we were oh, the witness two, that's trip. Two, no, to be fair, two co- no, to be fair, they were it was an informal wedding for uh for uh benefits uh military military benefits, benefits. That's and, the, and that's probably a good clarification yeah and then they had a more formal ceremony with uh with family but then yeah. when they thought of where should we get married they thought to themselves we should do it in the dojo with bob um looking on body that's a trip. Bag. yeah did, did bob officiate 
<laughs> he was in some of the he, he, <laughs> he, has, he, he made the photos but he was sure. in the photos he was definitely oh what a riot oh that's great if you if you have access to those photos please <laughs> send one over because i i want to see it and i'm sure the listeners do too yeah well i'll look through the archives now of course th- this is this is not why i mean this is not why we brought you on Good. Um, we we always have this this early chatter and it almost never has anything to do with real martial arts and, and martial arts subject of of any substance you know it's usually it's weather it's you know what did you eat for lunch it's these these kind of silly things but i enjoy that because it it gives everyone an opportunity to let their guard down and go oh, okay you know we're we're just having a chat you know but we're talking about martial arts we're talking about a lot of things related to martial arts today and so what i'd love to do is get some context for everything else we're going to talk about and and for each of you to tell me to tell the listeners how you got started with martial arts? I think Chris should go first because he started first. Okay. I, um, I had always wanted to study martial arts. One of those classic, like I always wanted to, and I was forbidden by my parents. And um, I hope she's not, my mom won't listen to this. Um, I hope everyone else does. Um, yeah, she, she wouldn't let me. And she had, it, it's because you kind of find out later, she had this image of the martial artist, you know, as portrayed in, you know, seventies and eighties movies of this, you know, thug who goes out and picks fights and whatnot. You know, I will not fight you. I will not fight you. Okay. I'll fight you, you know? Um, and she didn't, she didn't want that. Um, and so when I got to college, uh, kind of the second that she wasn't watching, I went and signed up at the uh, dojo down the street. Um, uh, and so a, a big part of my early career was like this, this mission to like change everybody's mind in the whole world about what it means to be a martial artist. So that, cause if my mother thought that, uh, martial artists who were thugs who went around and picked fights, uh, then other people in the world thought that too. Um, and, uh, it's kind of on this mission. It's like, no, I'm a pacifist. I remember, uh, it was one of my assistant's girlfriends got sat next to me at a banquet one time, uh, just by coincidence. And she looked really nervous. I'm like, why do you, why do you look so nervous? She's like, was just such a weird environment to be all these martial artists. Like, she's like, I'm a pacifist. And I said, well, I'm a pacifist too. We have that in common. And she, she just was taking it back. She didn't know how to, how to respond to the notion that martial art, but it, because that went against what she thought she knew, uh, you know, about martial artists. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was my, my start as a martial artist. And I, during college, I spent more time at the dojo than I did in classes. Um, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's, it's turned out just fine. Um, and, um, yeah. And then I became an instructor and opened some schools and, and, uh, that kind of stuff. And so I was somewhere in there, Chris and I met and he not in the dojo, not in the dojo. Um, at the time I was really into dance and the stage and music and he encouraged me to try martial arts and I resisted because in my mind, martial arts were for little brothers like mine, smelly little brothers. And it had nothing to do with me. I hope he listens to (laughs) Smelly little brothers. Can I, can I ask how old are you? How old you are at this time? I'm 40. No, not, not now, but when you started. Oh, okay. You know, Uh, when that conversation, because most adults don't think, don't, at least around me, I I don't have siblings. They don't describe their younger siblings as smelly little brothers when they're adults. Yeah, it's that I picked up my brother from things like martial arts and he was really smelly afterward. So I associate (laughs) things together. I I I really hope he listens to this. You know, he's no longer little. He's (laughs) he's the best. Not surprisingly, bigger than so admirable. He's uh, one of my senior students and and Holly's peer, and um, and a a very talented martial artist. Very talented martial artist. Now, what about his hygiene? Uh, Excellent. Is it's it okay? Now. So yeah. he 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 I transcended that. Zero comments on on. <laughs> I, I just have no interest. Well, she brought in it. it up, so yeah, I I, I felt fair. we needed to close the loop on that. That's fair. That's fair. So in my mind, this was something I was never going to do, and he pestered me for a good year. Um, and finally, when he stopped asking, then I thought I should try it. It was probably a lesson in that that I refused to learn. Yes. Mm. Um, and I, like I said, I was into dance at the time, so I still remember my first lesson. Um, with my, I, I revere him so much, but to that first day was a great embarrassment because as he put me into horse dance, I, I was like, sir, are you, you sure it's not like this? And I kept trying to put my toes out in plie. It's like, I think it's like this. <laughs> like, no. Um, and I really, honestly, I, I, I was so excited about the, the physicality of it. 
but it was when I went to support Chris at a, a tournament, my first tournament experience, watching the high ranking black belts compete that I then was smitten. It was a, a, a certain grace and strength. like this iron, this liquid metal was what it was to me um, that I wanted and that, that the other things I was doing couldn't provide. Liquid metal. I haven't heard that before. Huh? Like the Terminator. That's what I was imagining. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> with a spear. I mean, that's, you know, the Terminator with a spear <laughs> might be the best compliment anyone's ever given a martial artist. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Oh, for sure. I, I can't. And I want you to understand that yeah. this Terminator had really long curly hair. It was a woman, right? You know, I, it was, I don't remember who. I don't think I ever met her, but yeah. Mm. She, she was who I wanted to be. Okay. This is this is all depth. I didn't I didn't know offline. You have to I still have things you don't know about me. This is so good to know. Good. That's what keeps it fresh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how, just, how long have you two been married? I don't know. It seems like forever. Ever. Uh, 17 ish. Wow. OK. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. 17. All right. So. You're 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 at this tournament and you're you're seeing this this example of someone that you would aspire to to be skill wise or, or presentation wise. At some point, did you bring your passion for dance and the way that you, I assume, performed dance into the way you trained and maybe performed martial arts? No, dance is forbidden in the studio. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, anytime. <laughs> and discussion of dance, comparisons <laughs> to dance movements. Mm. Um, the, you know, this is like a choreographed dance statements will be banned, uh, punished. You know, yeah. Oh, so that's not what forms are. They're not, they're not prearranged dance like movements. You, they're prearranged movements with, with a bleep in the middle. Oh man, yeah. Anytime I do any kind of um, anomaly to to dance or music in the dojo, Chris just closes his eyes and shakes his head. Yeah. So there's, so no, there's, no, really there's no toes out horse dances. Yeah, I'm, no like, toes I'm out. actually a you to death. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those dancers are strong. Yes, they are. But no, no. I was, I was just a fledgling dancer at the time. You know, it wasn't like something that... Okay. That that defined me that I need, needed to bring into it. I was easily moldable. Thing I'm sure my instructors were happy for that. Mm. Nice. Now, of course, at some point, you know, in there, you you two got married, and I'm guessing based on title and conversation that we've had before, you're running this school or schools together. So how did how did that happen? How did all of that kind of coalesce into what I'm assuming is is more of a team effort now? Um, yeah, I don't know. Do we have a team? Are we on a team? We're always a team. We're a team. We, uh, you know, we opened our first school. Um, and, uh, as you know, some people who have opened schools can relate to, you know, we didn't have any money and we were massively in debt. Um, and the landlord expected us to pay rent every single month. Um, and so did our mortgage bank. And so Holly went and got a real job and, you know, she stepped, she came by after, after work and trained and whatnot, but, uh, she had a, what, what we, Oh, and it was a grueling, oh, it was a terrible job. One of those desky desk decks, real job, customer complaints and stuff like that at a, at a real company. <laughs> but they paid real money, also, which was cool. Um, but she kind of hated it, and so once um, the studio could support us, um, I just told her she should quit her job if she wanted to, and she did. And uh, then she started hanging out at the dojo, and I'm not sure if you use this very endearing term, but dojo rat is the term that we use sometimes for that person who just kind of hangs around the studio, yeah. uh, whether they're classes or not. And so she became our first dojo rat in our new studio. And uh, if you hang around studios long enough, as, as I think many people can relate to, you eventually get told to do things. So to go start this class and go do this and whatnot. Um, and she was just a volunteer, a full-time volunteer for years and years. And then uh, we were getting ready to open our second school. And, um, I don't know if we should, we had two, two guys lined up to be the main teacher, plan A and plan B, like thing one and thing two. And, um, <laughs> they, they both were unable to do that. Yeah. Well, let's just leave it at that. There's, there's a little bit of tragedy involved. Um, and so you uh, were, you were plan C. She was I was plan, plan C. C and you well, know what, well, you know, I told you, I never wanted to study martial arts. Well, I finally let go and studied it. I said, but don't ever ask me to teach because yeah. that's, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And then turns out that when I left that job, 
and it really loved teaching. And she wasn't Plan C. <laughs> she wasn't Plan C because you know she wasn't qualified. She was Plan C because she refused to be Plan A. Yeah, was, it's like okay, fine. I'm going to teach, but I'm not going to run a studio. Just don't ever go that crazy. Yeah, and then I she agreed to be Plan C, like so that I could you know, develop the courage to, you know, sign this, this giant lease and make the commitments necessary to open another studio. Um, and she said, well, you know, everything's gonna be fine. You won't need me to run it. Um, and then, and then what happened happened. And, uh, she went off and ran our second school and was the best, uh, chief instructor I've ever employed. Um, and did that for a number of years, uh, very, very wonderfully and well. And, uh, you know, it was a neat relationship because I think one of the, anyone who, who's managed, you know, multiple studios, uh, knows that one of the challenges is knowing everything that's going on and, you know, uh, well, you know, studios aside, anyone who's ever managed anyone, uh, you'd really like them to bring you their questions. And oftentimes people are shy about bringing their questions to their box because they're, you know, well, I don't want to admit, I don't know how to do things and all that kind of stuff. And she just didn't have any of that. So, you know, we had long conversations. We'd go out to dinner after. after yeah, it's really cool to talk shop together. I miss that time. It was a good time. I could have told you back then every restaurant in a five mile radius that, uh, that was open past 10 PM on a weeknight. Mm. Um, and we, you know, we'd meet at a restaurant and we, you know, we talk and we'd recap and she'd ask the questions and we got to have a lot of learning together. Um, so that went really, really well, you know, and then, then she had kids, my kids, our kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like cliche, right? You know, but they, you know, the, yeah. and you know, people don't always stop being an instructor when they do that. But that was my choice. I was looking yeah. forward to being a full time mom, so that was my graceful exit from from that period of our life together. It was a really nice time. When we talk about going back to it, where we run a school together, yeah. And um, but the kids are ages six, eight, and nine now, or six, eight, and ten, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, and they take up a lot of our our energy needless to say so we have then we opened a third and a fourth and uh and later this month i'm excited to say we're opening our fifth wow congratulations thank you now during those during those early days where you were somewhere between co-worker and you know boss employee but also married how did you navigate that dynamic especially <laughs> with sad I, I'm. I don't know if we did. Guessing <laughs> that you set some boundaries at right. some point. Every every time I talk to a couple that runs a business, they end up with some kind of boundaries about we're going to not talk work on this day or in these scenarios oh. or anything. I just, I just you know, did, how how did you how were you able to work through that and you know obviously remain married and, you would and think, loving, you know, yeah, yeah I, I hear what you're saying, Jeremy. You would think that we would have to to not talk about the dojo at some point. That's, That's all, we, had all to talk about. we wanted to talk about. And you know, it was so funny at the end of the day, even when we were side by side all day, we'd get in the car and we'd still have things that we had to talk about because we, we didn't have the same experiences. Even yeah. if, um, even if we were right in the same room with I, the same student, we'd want to been asked about the, it. We've been asked the questions a thousand times because, um, you know, like you say, so many people have, you know, run studios together and some have a lot of trouble with it. And we just never did. Like it was never, it was never challenging. There was never a weird authority dynamic. There was never, um, I joked with somebody, it was purely joking. Um, somebody called me up and he said, you know, how do you make this work? You know, my wife's thinking about coming to the studio and teaching and whatnot. And, um, and I said, well, at the studio, you know, I'm in charge and at home, she's in charge and all balances out, which was just meant to be like this flippant joke because that's all silliness. And he says, well, then that won't work for us because I'm in charge at home too. And I said, okay. Is that really what he said? Really wow. Did. They're not, they're not, <laughs> I don't, this won't come as a shock to anyone and I'm not using any names, but they're not married anymore. <laughs> that was just, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a healthy dynamic. Mm. We did, uh, maybe it was helpful that Chris set out his expectations early and like i said we we hit our absolute perfection that's the, our <laughs> expectation absolutely we hit our relationship in the beginning um and so it was very easy for me just to pretend you are you are my instructor and nothing else and so calling him sir and giving him a hundred percent deference was fine and then he he just is a great manager uh if i can shoot your horn a little <laughs> bit he never, did not pay me to say this never guy. considered myself to be a good manager um, that's very really nice <laughs> but he, or maybe it's just because we know how to work together right but he he knew how to motivate me and encourage me and despite the fact that i was playing this role of subservient student person he never 
lord it over me or made me feel well nor should one lord over (laughs) you know regular (laughs) students and employees you know one should treat you know all of their all of their students and all of their assistants and and what all of their staff with respect and so that just kind of goes i don't see that i think that it just boiled down to we had very clear guidelines of what we were going to do Um, we're going to crush it yeah no (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) that was the goal well it sounds like you are crushing it. And one of the things that I think is really interesting with what you're doing now is that you're not living the lifestyle, excuse me, at least at the moment, that most people would expect of a married couple running multiple martial arts schools. So let's take a bit of a hard left here and let's talk about what you are doing. Is this because we're 2,000 miles away from the studios right now? I I, I think, yeah, I, I think it's, I don't, I don't know of any schools that are run, owned and run remotely uh, in any kind of an active way. You know, this is, I'm not going to say unique, but it's certainly uncommon. And there's a reason behind it, right? I mean, we, we, we talked a little bit beforehand and I know a little bit about what's going on with you guys. So why don't you tell the audience why you decided to, you know, go 2000 miles away and not be there for the day-to-day operations of your schools. Well, in 2000, we're just getting warmed up. We um, we are officially and formally on a sabbatical. And I like to say that we're on a sabbatical because uh, midlife crisis just doesn't focus group well. Um, and um, But we have, uh, as you said, extricated ourselves from the day-to-day operations, which is you know only possible because I have the most wonderful and glorious staff that anyone could ever ask for. And uh, we are traveling around the world with our three children. Yeah. And the sabbatical, I think, is a good word, aside from Chris's humor. It's a good word because we're really excited about learning from the world instead of being in our own microcosm. Uh, We've been there for a good 17 years, right? And we want an opportunity to learn martial arts included. You know, we're very excited to be headed over to Asia and and see with our own eyes some of the things we've only just been interpreting yeah. up until now. But beyond the world of, of martial arts, we want to grow as people and understand uh, where what, what direction we want to take our life and our career from here. Yeah, we've had, um, like she said, it's not exclusively martial arts, but there's definitely... Uh, um, has to have been and will be some martial art components. You know, we've, we've just been in the U S so far. We have two more months here in the U S before we head over to, uh, the East coast of Asia. Um, and you know, we stopped in to visit some, um, some studios, uh, people we know, um, have been kind enough to host us. We have, a um, made it to a conference and, uh, I have another conference coming up and, uh, we have a seminar at the end of next month that we're going to, and, a, and a about promotion we're attending and, you know, and, you know, so there's, there's a certain quantity of that, but then, like she said, we get to Asia and or to, you know, spending some time in, in Japan and, and in China and, and in, um, in Thailand and whatnot and the Philippines and you know, kind of hit on some of, uh, some of the roots. It was wonderful with, at this, uh, past conference in Chicago run by ProMac. Denver. Sorry. We flew from Chicago to Denver. Yeah. Uh, in Denver with ProMac exposing those boys of ours to, a whole world of martial arts, you know, up till now, they've really only known our dojos. Yeah, it was pretty great. There were, you know, 500 attendees or whatever. And uh, three of them were under the age of 18 in the world. So, right. you know, former Olympic judo champion said that they could come attend his class on takedowns. And that, that was definitely one of their highlights. And another um, gentleman who, st- who trains in, in Kali was going back to some of the more indigenous roots of it, Sinawali. And, oh man, they loved that class, you know? So, um, we're, we're so excited to be, to be exposing ourselves and them to what the world has to offer beyond what we've known up to this point. That's great. Now, how are you choosing where you're going? Worth it. Yeah. Do you have like a dartboard and a map? Cause that's, <laughs> no, actually a lot of it has to do with those martial arts. Yeah. Actually, flips. Yeah, a lot of our North America <laughs> tour is like, okay, we have to be here on this date and here on this date, here in this date. And then let's kind of like see what's in between. Um, there's a lot of that. And then it's, you know, just kind of trying to be logical in terms of, uh, we we're, we're planning on spending a couple of years doing this. So, um, we hope to see, you know, saying the whole world is a little naive, but, uh, cause it's really, really big, but, uh, we want to get to, to, a lot of places. And so we're just kind of going from one place to the place next to it. So when we get over to, um, Asia, we'll start in, uh, Siberia 
and uh, and kind of work our way down um, Siberia because it'll be late summer and and a good time to be in Siberia and a bad time to be in uh, China in China in uh, from a weather standpoint and uh, we'll work our way down from there as the uh, as the as the year gets cooler. I'm so excited about that. Nice, nice. And what are you traveling in? Five of you traveling. I'm assuming this is not you know a a, a Toyota Corolla. Well, we're in the Midwest it's, right yeah, now. We're a, by all the national parks. So I was like, oh, so you're doing that RV thing, huh? Yeah, no, we're in a midsize sedan. Really? Yeah. And and, and, uh, and are you getting on each other's nerves? How are the kids handling I this? Don't know. Are you getting? Are you? There's a little bit of backseat stuff. Some, we we joked no, that in Yellowstone, nonsense. like, oh, look, we have the classic Yellowstone family experience. We're, 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 going, <laughs> we're going too fast. There's just it's too just much. Irritable. There's too much to see in you know in uh, in North America. We have too many friends to visit places to be and um so we're like oh look yellowstone we have 24 hours to tour yellowstone off we go you know and uh so we're we're going very quickly um no but for the most part uh, oh, people always ask about our boys you know are, do they get along and they they are best the friends best of friends they are good good now when people talk about sabbaticals i mean of course the term sabbatical comes out of academia usually you know university level academia and Quite often, in fact, I'd say every time that I've been familiar with a professor taking time off on a sabbatical, there's a purpose behind it. There's some some advanced research they want to do. There's mm-hmm. a place that they want to go. There's a book they want to finish. There's some goal. There's there's some kind of finish line That's that right. they're, they're hoping to achieve. Is that the same for well, you we two? already finished our book. Okay. I can't say it's for Our that. book actually published the day after we left. Like yeah, we got in the car fun. on Monday and on Tuesday the book came out. Wow. Um, but it's no, it's it's for for our it is it's research for how we want to live our life because we realized that we were doing it just kind of um, accidentally, you know, s- slipping down the the slide of mainstream without a lot of conscious thought. Uh, and I know that that folks out there who are thinking, well. Martial arts teacher isn't exactly your classic job. I suppose that's that's true. <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> um, but no, we wanted to uh, spend some time uh, exploring the world and learning about it and learning from it and um, and uh, kind of broaden our horizons. And you know, everybody who who hears that we're doing with this kids you know, with our kids are very quick to say, "Oh, this will be so good for your kids." It's like, well, and and I and I believe it will be, but but we're we were motivated to do this. Uh, you know, irregardless of of the kids, and we're excited about what they're getting out about it as uh, getting out of it as well. Uh, but we're excited about learn, you know, meeting people and learning and, and uh, having a, a deeper and broader understanding of the world. Two questions that kind of go together: Do you have expectations of what you will be learning, and do you have hopes of what you will learn? Well, shut or to to say it slightly differently, rather than learn, change. Do you have expectations of how you, your family may change? Do you have hopes? You know, the hopes maybe being a bit broader or grander than the expectations. Well, I, you know, I think like anyone who studied martial arts for a long time, I, you know, I've come to appreciate the value of incrementalism. You know, come to appreciate that, you know, when, you know, when I was a purple belt and I went to my first seminar, you know, after training for however many months, um, you know, I wanted to like learn, you know, four new forms and death touch, you know, and if I got anything less out of this seminar, you know, that's was a terrible disappointment. And now, you know, all these years later, you know, if I attend a seminar and I just get a, a glimmer of greater understanding of one form of movement, uh, you know, I consider that to be a win. And that's something that I can, you know, I can put in my back pocket, I can take with me from now on. And, um, so I, I don't know that I have any grandiose hopes. I don't expect that at the end of this, I will be able to speak with animals or walk on water. Um, but I do. Those are reasonable. Good, good example. Thank you. And, uh, but, uh, but I hope to just have a slightly more nuanced uh, kind of view of the world and our place in it. And, uh, and then of course I have the same hopes for, for, uh, for the kids. Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. I, I'm finding myself wrestling with, you know, we're, we're in a martial arts podcast right now. So I think all the folks out there are going to have this term resonate them with them, um, with the discipline of a, a routine life, um, trying to maintain that while having an absolutely <laughs> upended life. Um, 
so I think that's my, my hope is that I can still be a person who is disciplined while, while doing this. But you were asking more about the, the end goal. And I want to maintain an open mind to not having an end goal. Aside from when we are done with this, being an ever more close-knit family and one that values family, uh, including our extended family, and beyond that, because I feel like we have that already, I want to be a better world citizen. And that is my hope. What, what does that term world citizen mean to you or a better world citizen? How would that, yeah. how would you know you've accomplished that? It means looking beyond my community, my immediate, out, out my front door and understanding how my actions impact or my lack of action impacts the world at large. And I think I'm hoping that by being out in the world at large and seeing humanity, um, you know, face to face instead of just having it be a, a concept, but, um, but to be in the places that I hear about on the news, um, and to have my hands in the, the dirt there, that I will understand and have greater motivation for, for acting in the world's interest at large. Does that make sense? I know that sounds Probably big. It does. It does. Um, you know, it, it's it's romanticized, certainly. Yeah. And I, I I think you know I'd be really interested in following up on this question when you come back at the end of your sabbatical and finding out, you know, maybe we can we can re-listen to this episode, you know, individually and then and then have a chat about it, about what changed. You know, what was the the reality versus the expectation and the hope. I mean, how, how long have you you been on the road now? Oh, less than two months so far. This okay. is we're so, at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot that can and, and I would expect will change. I mean, people don't take journeys of this scope without having something change. It, it, it isn't always dramatic, but it tends to be substantial. And it's not always substantial in the moment. Sometimes it's in hindsight. You know, I, I had a, um, a vacation I took in 2013, and it was the first vacation I ever did solo. And I had this feeling going into it, uh, you know, these big things were going to happen if, if, uh, if either of you ever read Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, okay, so classic book. We've talked about it on the show a number of times, you know, very, very pivotal book for me. I, I was expecting some kind of crazy journey, like, you know, like, like the stuff Dan had, had experienced. And I, I didn't get any of that. But over the next couple of years, as I looked back on it, I realized how transformational it really was. I just needed more context and more time with the lessons to fully understand what they were. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what kind of journey this sabbatical becomes for each of you. And I'll give you an update on the speaking with animals and, and walking on water. <laughs> yeah, by all means. I mean, we, we would, um, I couldn't, you know, if, right. if, if you offer, offer some kind of online program of how to speak with animals, I mean, mm-hmm. we would certainly awesome. want to promote that for you. You know, maybe Appreciate we could give the listeners a discount code or something Correct. to incentivize. That would be cool. Perfect. <laughs> all right now what are what are your students thinking about all this oh, you've shit. left this pretty deep solid i mean it's got to be a solid group of people solid community you talked about the instructors and in, that, that you're leaving these schools with and, and they being solid but anybody that's that's trained at a a martial arts school that maybe is not as strong on community might look at what you two are doing and think there's no way my school would survive (laughs) the instructor leaving. So I think that this says a lot about not only who you've chosen to carry the torch for you while you're gone, but the people that you have training. So what, what was their response when you told them all, Hey, we're going to bail for a while. See ya. (laughs) Cause that's exactly what it is. Right. Uh, well, and, and it's, to be honest, you know, we've been talking about this for years and years and, um, and that's, that's always been the thing holding us back is just me needing to feel like it was, uh, you know, secure and solid and, uh, that everyone is going to continue to have the kind of positive experience in the studio that they needed. Uh, so we've been kind of, uh, backing away slowly, uh, for, for quite a while, um, until, uh, you know, Holly hasn't done uh, a ton of teaching since the kids were born. And, um, and she'd been handing that off for quite a while. And, and I've been, you know, I haven't been full time in a school for, for quite a while either. Um, 
and so kind of backed off to the point where I was just teaching, you know, black belts and volunteers and and staff, and then kind of back off to even even uh, even fewer, and uh, and slowly and gently handing over uh, some of my students to uh, to my staff. And so it wasn't a very, it wasn't a precipitous drop. I wasn't in the studio six days, um, and then zero. Um, it was you know, six and then five and then four, and then eight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it was, it was gradual and there was a lot of like, uh, over the last couple of years, it's like, let's go to Ireland for three weeks and see how this works if we're not there at all. And that works pretty well. And so let's go to, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, a little bit at a time. So it's been gradual and it's, and, and felt very solid before we before we took the leap. Even so, Jeremy, I'm gonna if I at the risk of bearing too much, Chris, I hope I don't. He was he was really concerned. And the the dojos not, you know, not surprisingly were what were holding us back from from going. He did not want to feel like he was abandoning his people. And it was um it was a moment, a, a moment of realization that finally convinced him to do it. That wh- while he was in this role of of being the head instructor at the studios and always there um, for for folks to lean upon, that those folks would never get an opportunity to rise to the amount of leadership of which they are capable. And so when he, excuse me, my earbud, hello. And so when he realized that um, and was able to, to speak from the heart in, in, in believing that to these people, then it was, it was not a, I'm leaving you conversation, but I'm stepping aside to offer you to grow into who you are. And that felt good. Well, in the fifth school that we mentioned opening, I'm, I'm not opening it. You know, our, our senior uh, instructor back there, back in, Virginia is, is opening that. And she had that opportunity because I'm not there, you know, in implicitly or explicitly preventing her from, from taking on that role and, and uh, being responsible for all of that. And she's doing an amazing job. Now, anybody that's ever started teaching knows that you, you learn a lot when you don't have someone, you know, looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it can be nerve wracking. It can be powerful. It can be, I would suggest, one of the most growth oriented times in a martial artist's life that that first year or so that they're teaching, mm-hmm. you know, second only oh, yeah. to probably their first year of training. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I remember what? the first time someone uh, told me that before yeah. I had been in that position myself. Um, and I thought he was just, I thought he was just talking. Like, I thought he was just like trying to sell, you know, me and, and everyone else in the room is like, you know, like, uh, convincing us that the, it was going to be better than it was to go off and, and do the things, you know, open schools and, and be in that position. But he was absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Like there's so much to be learned um, in that time when you don't, when you have to figure out answers yourself and, you know, and it parallels every other form of education, right? You know, the answers that are provided to us are never as meaningful and never stick as well as the things that we figure out for ourselves. Right. Right. Now in the two months that you've been gone, I imagine that there have have probably been some some hiccups, some things that have popped up. Mm. But I also imagine that honestly, no, not yet, <laughs> none, really. Yeah, everything's going smoothly. Yeah, and he's uh, checking in regularly, of course. Yeah. You know, um, awesome. I think the only hiccup was when we tried to be a part of the the Tuesday instructor. Oh yeah, workout. we thought like one weekend. Oh, we like, can't wait hey, to share stuff, guys. We came to this conference. Studio. And we just interrupted their mojo and yeah. should have. They're all like, can we get back to our workout now? <laughs> you know, with respect, <laughs> sir. You know, like, but we were doing fine without you. Yeah, no, they're, they are. They're doing great. Nice, nice. And, and when you're checking in, what, what are you seeing of their growth? Because I, I imagine that they're, you know, if, if, if you aren't having hiccups, it means that either you are brilliant fortune tellers and saw everything that could go wrong and made sure everyone was prepared or they're rising to the occasion. I'm going to guess it's the latter. Oh, I guess so. We could have, I, I think we could go with the former, like genius, like <laughs> <laughs> they're just super soothsayers. People, soothsayers. <laughs> I'm going to get a new hat. Ah, uh, this is soothsayer. Um, no, they're just, they're, they're encountering things. And then instead of, you know, and they are still asking me, you know, like I said, we, you know, we talk, uh, you know, phones are, are magical and, and WhatsApp and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And so we, we have a certain quantity correspondence, but mostly they're like, hmm, you know, I was going to go ask him, uh, but maybe I could just figure this out on my own. Okay, look, I figured it out and it worked out fine. And, uh, you know, they've had a couple small events and, and they've all gone well and they're planning some bigger ones. And, and like I said, there's a school being opened and, and new staff being hired and, and um, interviewed and whatnot. And everything's going just like it's supposed to. And they to. have each other. We've been a tight team for a long time. Yeah, no, they're they're a great resource for each other. I've said it a thousand times to them that if they could each learn from each other everything that they each individually know, um, you know, they they would surpass me and everybody else, you know, that you can imagine. They um, and so they, I think they're doing a good job of of doing that of being resources for each other. Oh, they're like that transformer creature, right? Where like individually they have all their powers, but then they come I don't, together. I with don't the, think the trans- what's that guy. Former, you're thinking of Voltron. You're Voltron, Voltron. Voltron. Sorry, guys. Such an embarrassment. I'm. I know. <laughs> there, there, there is a subset of of martial arts nerds right now that are are cringy. Right? I, oh, that, cringy. Um, Shoot. So, Which brings me but, to but that's okay. Cringer and Thundercats. No, Stop. that's He Man. Hush, hush. <laughs> Stop it, Terminator girl. Uh, yeah. So, so this, this has come to an abrupt halt, but let's see if I can bring it back. I think that we have a lot of martial arts instructors listening who might be thinking, you know, I would, I would love to take all this time off and, and I have some great senior students and even the economics of what I have that it would support that. But I don't know how to get from the point that I'm at to being able to leave. Yeah. So what, what things did you have to put in place? Because if, if I, I'm assuming it wasn't day one when you started your school that you said, you know, I'm going to make sure that all of my senior team knows know. how to run everything. I, I intend so to I be off. in every school seven days a week. You know, I was going to somehow be in multiple schools at the same time. Yeah. I don't know how I yeah, and, and that's what most martial arts instructors sure. plan on doing. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it was, was taking, you know, you know, well, I definitely was taking me out of the equation. It was, and, and taking my, uh, ego and need for prominence out of the equation. Um, you know, in our, our schools are, you know, run by the individuals who run them, the men and women who run them. And, you know, yes, they have an instructor and I, you know, you know, named, you know, you know, Sharon Crescentil or whatever they call me. Um, you know, he exists and he's out there and he comes to town once in a while and he does a seminar. But, but first and foremost, they look to their instructor and, uh, that's an important nuance that I, that I don't know if that dynamic, uh, exists in every studio. You know, it's not, the studios are not about me. The studios are about the, the, the students and, and the, and then to a lesser extent, the, the individual who runs that studio. And, uh, you know, that took a lot of, like I say, you know, setting my ego aside and letting it be that way. And, uh, and then, and then the gradual implementation of, of pulling back and seeing what people can do on their own and letting them do more and letting them do more. And, yeah. and you know, and people, people tend to respond very well to the expectations that you have for them. And if you have, uh, low demeaning expectations for them, they tend to have, you know, low, um, you know, unimpressive results. And if you have, uh, high and uh, and lofty expectations for them, they tend to rise to those occasions too. It's a lot like uh, where we say the same thing about parenting. Mm. Okay. Nice, nice. And yeah, I, I don't believe it's a dynamic that we're used to seeing. At least it's not a dynamic that I've seen often. In that the school owner, the the let's call it figurehead, the people who are responsible for managing everything, are kind of a step removed are showing up occasionally it seems to be much more the majority of the time you know so if you have five schools you know you're you're at each you know one day a week mm-hmm. kind of a thing but it doesn't sound like that's what you're doing no and you know there's certainly a phase where we went through that and then and then just great generating the confidence that uh that the people running the schools are are uh, qualified to do so you know like mm-hmm. you have to you have to you know get to that point in your head and it's like you know what no you know they, they can run these schools. Like they, they are qualified to do this. They are, you know, and the reality as you look back, it's so funny. Um, everybody running a school right now has more teaching and martial arts experience than I did when I opened my first school by myself. Mm. And, uh, and they have each other, which I didn't have. Uh, and they have me if I'm called away, which I didn't have, you know, um, they are, they are highly qualified and, and, uh, highly skilled. 
And you just have to, you know, believe that and, and know that that doesn't mean they're perfect and know that that doesn't mean that they have answered every question and that I no longer have any value in the world, but rather just that, um, that they're going to, they're going to handle this, the difficulties that they encounter as well or better than I would handle the ones that I encountered way back when and we survive. So they'll survive. Gotcha. Now let's talk about this book. You know, we kind of buried the lead on that and that was intentional because books tend to lead to uh, a lot of different conversation that, that I think we need context for. We, we need more stories before we can fully understand them. Fair enough. So tell us, tell us about this book that was, you know, that was published day two of your sabbatical. Absolutely. Right? So, you could, so you could be on vacation the rest of it. Oh, we tried to stay from an academic word. Don't say the V word. I think no? all the martial arts instructors. I'm not saying there, it's inaccurate, Jeremy. <laughs> don't, say it. don't say it. It sounds bad. I think all the martial arts instructors out there can identify with the, um, and I say this because I've talked to a lot of them at, at conferences and they say, yes, I would like to write that book of, of seeing what's working for parents and what's not working for parents. You know, just witnessing the dynamic in their lobby, the interaction between those two people and wanting to say something about it to help out. And um, in our dojos, we have we have the voice, you know, to those parents who give it to us. We have the opportunity to be a, a voice in their choir, so to speak. Um, but we thought, well, what if we could bring the the knowledge that we've gained from from teaching and from interacting with parents and kids? to a greater audience and help help folks out with the lessons we have from martial arts. So I'll just state the obvious. The book is called Resilience Parenting, uh, Raising Resilient, Ch Resilient Children in an Era of Dependence and uh, Detachment and Dependence. And um, yeah, and like Holly said, the, well, and if I can take it a step back, that as most martial arts instructors know, with especially with younger children, the most valuable things that we teach and provide to young children have nothing to do with what people visualize martial arts as being. Um, that we teach them to uh, respect and discipline and focus and confidence and uh, and how to interact uh, positively and politely with the people around them and how to be confident, how to stand up in front of a you know a judge or, or an instructor and you know announce who they are and do what they're here to do and and uh, you know put themselves out there in public and all of these wonderful skills that have that are you know important to and complementary with uh, but have nothing to do with punching and kicking per se. And so that's where the opportunity was. And so the book is written from our experience as martial arts instructors, you know, and of course as parents, but to a much larger extent for all of the years that we've been teaching all of the thousands of kids that we've had the honor of teaching and, um, and kind of trying to distill those lessons and then present them, uh, obviously in a way that's accessible to martial artists, but also, um, uh, more intentionally to, to anyone, regardless of whether or not they are martial artists so that, parents who for whatever reason aren't putting their kids in a martial arts program and i and i'm sure uh, you feel the same way believe they all should um but even if they're not going to perhaps they could pick up this book and gain a little bit of what the martial arts offers in a way that's uh, accessible to them absolutely yeah we have a saying on this show and and by on this show i mean i have a saying that everyone should do martial arts for at least six months because there's nothing else that's going to give you lifelong impact in six months, the way martial arts will. So, sure. or it sounds great. So you know, 12 months. Or, yeah. Yeah, you know, More whatever. is better, certainly. More yeah. is better. <laughs> but in, the, in this world where people are, what's that? I'm saying as adults in particular, because adults, yeah, we just see parents in our, our lobby so often say, oh, this is just for them. Oh, um, breaks my heart. But we so, so often see adults who aren't willing to challenge themselves in a potentially embarrassing, but yet, yeah, revealing this is way. going to be our next book slash crusade uh to follow Good. this one is the 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 message that uh you know martial arts uh is for everybody it's not for kids it's not for adults it's for everybody uh at every phase of life it has things to offer and and uh, help us develop both physically and, and uh, mentally and emotionally in all of the ways that we need to to develop um and make sure that we we bring that to everybody successfully mm, great I, you know, I actually just received some feedback from a show listener this morning and, and he was telling the story pretty much as you had just articulated about, you know, he brought his kid for years and watched from the sidelines and finally one day said, do you offer adult classes? Mm -hmm. And he described it in very, very good detail, 
the emotional response when he went to his first class just to watch and watching what he saw as these, you know, big, strong, tough looking martial artists coming in with their uniforms and everything. And, and this feeling of, I'm not going to belong in this group and his, his desire to, to literally run, mm -hmm. you know, no one's going to know, no one's going to know if I leave now. Mm -hmm. And he convinced himself to stay. And it was just, it was so well articulated mm -hmm. that it's, it really, you know, granted it was only this so morning, but it really that, stuck with me. Pull that instructor aside. And I want to say, you know, uh, don't let people watch, explain that it makes, it makes their <laughs> this is my instructor it training. It intimidates them. Out. It intimidates <laughs> yeah. people. And that it's much more comfortable to be lined up in the back of class with a senior student assigned to you, your partner and say, this is Cheryl and she's going to be part, your partner today. And she's going to answer any questions that you have uh, as you go through class. And that's a much more comfortable situation. And, and you also have them inside of the studio with a senior right next to them. So if they do try to run, you can like, because <laughs> yeah even yes. even as someone who's been studying martial arts for for more than a decade i still get nervous coming into a class of unfamiliar martial artists of tough guys you know yes it is that, intimidating. that feeling never goes away yeah at least for me i mean i've been, I've been training a while and I, I i'm going to school tonight run by friends they took it over from another friend when he retired. And this is my first time going to this iteration of the school. Now it's in the same spot that I've been to plenty of times, mm -hmm. but I'm still nervous. Yep. Sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. <laughs> Nothing is scary about Sweep the leg. Are you two watching Cobra Kai? No, we are. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're not. It's so no. good. It's so good. It. Everyone out there, you should be watching Cobra Kai. Okay. It is a brilliant show. If you were at all a fan of the Karate Kid movies, mm -hmm which says something you're, you're probably of a certain age if you are. Of course. Well, we like number one a lot and number two pretty much and number three not so much, et cetera, et cetera. And I heard right. there are others, but I don't know. And then, and then we don't usually talk about number four, oh. which is ironic because number four has the, the, is the, the only one that has someone that I know personally in it. Oh. Uh, and and um, I don't believe she listens to the show. So uh, we'll sorry, tell sorry. her if we run into her, we'll tell her she should. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's let's start to kind of wrap some things up and connect some of the dots that we've been we've been putting out here today. First off, where can people learn more about the book? Uh, the book it can one can learn more about the book at our website uh, resilienceparenting.info. Um, and again, it's and of course it's available on Amazon and and lots of other places as well. The reason our uh, listeners today would go to it, uh, whether they are teachers or parents. Um, and I haven't even had adults just say it's it's good advice for for living. The, the book focuses on principles from the martial arts. You know, we did our very best to bring it to an audience that's that's broad to just still, well, what is it about martial arts that helps people become resilient? And we, we boiled it down to learning, integrity, and service. Um, and, and the third part of the book actually helps teachers just to be better teachers. It focuses on, on how to engage with younger people. Yeah. Part know, three was a lot of stuff coming way. from our instructor training directly right. from our instructor training is how you can be a better Well, and Part one sets up the dynamic that a parent should approach um, parenting as a, as a teacher within a yeah. teacher mindset as an instructor would. So if any of those things sound of, of interest or curiosity to someone, then and I hope they come check it out. Well, and I, I joke about it that um, because she says, you know, it's kind of applicable to everyone. What I wanted to write was a book, um, you know, telling people how they should live their lives better. But I, I realize those things are never as well received as as books about how you can teach other people to live their life better. So that people, <laughs> it's just like the parent in the lobby, yeah. that the parent, and it's so true, though, right? That the parent in the lobby is absolutely positive that their kids should study martial arts so that they can be a better version of themselves. But somehow, as we talked about, uh, they can sit in the stands and somehow you know, not realize that that same logic uh, applies to themselves so often. And um, Which is why the book would be good for someone who's not a parent. Is that mm -hmm. I see. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the questions that we've skipped over, and it's, it's the question that I, I, I want to make sure that I ask, is around stories and your favorite stories from your time training, you know, could be directly training or indirectly training because that's really the heart of the show is, is telling these stories. And you've told a lot of stories today, but I'd love to hear from each of you when you reflect on your time 
you know, whether it's just over the last couple months or over the last, you know, years, as it relates to martial arts, what are your favorite stories? So I'll share a tournament story if I can. Um, so I, when I started studying martial arts, was, the school I was at was part of a large organization, lots of schools. And um, my school was, was relatively new. I was um, one of the highest ranks in that. I think I was in the first brown belt test that ever occurred. Uh, you know, first batch of brown belts to come out of that one school. Um, and um, we were headed to this big central tournament and there were like 300 or I'm sorry, 3000 participants. It was in the, this big, uh, you know, college um, event center and whatnot. And um, one of the events was weapon forms. And it was the last, uh, Holly's smirking because she now knows what story I'm telling. Um, and um, it was the last event of the day. They cleared the rest of the floor. And uh, the, I think there were like 40, 50, maybe even 60 of us in this group uh, doing weapons forms. And um, a whole bunch of um, other students from my school stayed to watch. Um, after their events had finished, because I was the first person from our studio to uh, to do a weapons form at tournament, and this was really exciting and whatnot. And I I stood in this long, long line with my weapon, and I was using a spear uh, for a Chinese form. And um, and uh, he, the master such and such, who was doing the attendance, he um, he went through the line, and then he said, "Is there anyone whose name I haven't called?" And, uh, and I'm like, oh, my, me, sir. And he said, okay. And I came forward and gave my name and whatnot. And, um, and then halfway through the group of people, um, I heard him call my name and I, and I raised my hand and, you know, ran up and he said, I thought you said I didn't call your name. I'm like, I don't, I, maybe I didn't hear it. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You know, whatever I stammered, whatever, you know, intimidated by the gruff voice of master such and such. Um, and, uh, he says, sit down, you go last. <laughs> yelled at and put back in line, set my spear back down. And, and then the other, you know, 40, 50, 60 people, however many, they all finished. And he's like, now you, you go now. And I went up there and I got my spear, took a deep breath and I looked up at the lights and I, and I set it on my shoulder and I did my salutation. I did my deep breathing and I went through and I did movement one and movement two, movement three. And somewhere around movement four, I slammed it into my shin and it flew out of my hands and went plink, 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 plink across the completely empty stadium with everybody watching and um, ran over, picked it up, bowed, sat back down. And the guy next to me was so nice. He's like, that looked so good until you dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that was a, a wonderful experience. <laughs> You know what? My story is going to be about failure too. And I guess it's because sometimes it's how we deal with failure, right? That, that defines. Well, and six months later, I went back to the tournament and I hit myself in the shin, but didn't drop it right? and kept it and got, I think third or something. And I think I went back six months later. And And that's one of those great lessons in martial arts because we, in training in martial arts, we are constantly putting ourselves online. If we're doing it right, we're putting ourselves past our comfort zone into things where we know we might fail. And then hopefully <laughs> <laughs> pushing on for the next goal, right? That the joy of martial arts, the joy of training is, is seeing ourselves improve and knowing that then we can transfer those, those um, reactions and the way that we decide to deal with failure, taking that into our daily lives outside of the studio off the mat um i think that's what what our book is about too well so my story comes from very recent embarrassment and um such such failure uh chris chris successfully broke two baseball bats with his shin uh Mm. under the training of chip townsend at this conference i was just thinking of chip the first thing that came to mind was man you and chip are crazy (laughs) <laughs> chip's been on the show he's a nut oh, i love him but he's nuts so he's cool. awesome i just think he's one of the greatest guys we hope to visit him in uh, november down in texas yeah. yeah just just for clarity it can be both you can be crazy and wonderful oh sure and i can still think the world of you i, I don't want listeners to think i think poorly at all of master uh, Tom. both of those things That's great guy yeah, yeah. yeah uh so yeah so then we're at this conference and chris says you know you should do it 
there's some other folks doing a single bat break on, on Sunday. Why don't you do that? And you know, I'm looking at my, the, the mole and the hair on my, sorry, that's half past a freckle. I, what time is it? Was, I never I wear a watch. I'm looking at my proverbial watch. To the fact that it was, was about 36 hours before. Yeah, it was, it was 36 hours before it was about to happen. I said, I have not practiced this. Are you crazy? And he said, Of course you have. You've been training for years. You know, your roundhouse kick is great and you can do this. And it took a lot for me to say yes. I did not want to do this. <laughs> and it's because I was afraid, you know breaking a bat on your shin seems like it could probably hurt someone. And, um, I didn't know if I was up to the task, but as, as we do so many times in, in the studio, we put faith into our instructors and we say, okay, if you think that I'm up for this, then I'm going to do it. And so then I practiced for the little bit of time that I had. And I felt really confident after working with, with Chip and with his daughter, she was wonderful. Um, my kick felt strong and I was like, all right, I've got this. Well, out of the five people, I'm one of the, the five women who's, who stepped up out of, you said how many hundreds of people at this uh, conference who decided to do this, I was the one who did not break the bat. Um, and I've never seen anyone not break a bat under, under Chip Townsend's leadership, uh, just to add a little bit of insult to injury. Oh, and, and a little lemon juice on all of that is that, of course, it's being streamed live over live. Facebook. Yeah, if you want to watch, you can find this Me on Facebook. Me failing to break this back. I kicked that thing again and again and again and it wouldn't break. We post this on the blog every week. You know, I think the, old, one of the first comments that came back was working at Ben and Dave. Oh, great. I know. <laughs> Which I didn't reply. I, I sat back because I replied to this man. Um, so yeah, that was that was a bit demoralizing. But I have to, t- I have to say that I very sincerely afterward felt proud of having put myself into that position to begin with. Well, there are 500 other people who could have been, you know, who could have been there that morning and and they chose not to be, but I, but I think that the, and then the other side I'm guessing you're about to say is that it just fired me up to train more. Um, and, and not only that, but it was so, it was so, uh, revealing that when my my children came up they wanted to to explain and give excuses for why it didn't happen our six-year-old was crying our six-year-old was crying he was so disappointed um you know they were all riled up to see this and and they were broken by this and and so for, for me to have failed in front of my children and then have an opportunity to react in the way that i want them to react to model okay so you you give everyone a high five and say good game and and you say thank you to your instructor and I'll be there at the next one, having trained some more and I hope to do it next time. That's what I want to see in you and that's what I'm going to do. And we, we touch on that a lot in the book, the idea that um, one of the tendencies of parents and instructors for that matter is to um, to hide their own uh, failures and missteps to kind of pretend that they never happened. And, uh, and we just think it's a, a really big mistake is that if we don't, um, share and, and, uh, our, uh, you know, our failures and our, our difficulties with our children and our students, then we miss an opportunity to show them exactly how it's done. Uh, cause none of us have gotten where we've gotten in life without uh, a certain number of failures. You know, I can talk about my first business going bankrupt and, and the number of times that we almost went bankrupt with our, with our studios, Potomac Kempo and, and, uh, you know, all the things that didn't go right. Um, but it's it's much more fun to talk about our successes and talk about our fifth school opening and talk about you know my ex degree black belt promotion and da 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 you know th- those are the fun things to talk about and so we tend to talk about those things, but I think it leaves the impression with our children and our students that um, that the successful people amongst us um, have never failed and have never uh, had a difficult day. And I think that that's a terrible, terrible illusion to give them because then when they do fail, uh, A, they've never, you know, been shown how to do it gracefully and how to, you know, learn from it and how to get up and, you know, you know continue on the next day. And, uh, but also I think that they, it risks making them identify as failure instead of understanding that a failure is an, an event. It's not a person that doesn't define us. And, um, I say, oh, well, you know, moms and dad have never failed at anything and I just failed this test and I must be, 
you know, I must be terrible and faulty and whatnot. And the reality is, yeah, you failed this test or whatever you failed. Uh, but you know, mom and dad have failed some things too. And, um, and so that by sharing, and in this case, you know, firsthand, not, not just a story, but right there, live feed, um, you know, with our kids, you know, it gives them an opportunity to, to really learn from that experience and grow and realize that, you know, like I said, failure doesn't define us. And, um, and we get up and we, you know, we get up tomorrow morning and, and then it's we- It's how we react that defines us. It's yeah. what we decide to do after. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This has been good stuff. Now, if people want to follow you, if they want to check out this journey that you're on, is, is there a way that they can do that? Yeah, Thank you. We We're having so much fun writing about it. You know, you, you mentioned early on that you, you hadn't, you needed to have some time to reflect on your travels before yeah. it meant something to you. And we're doing our very best to reflect as we go. I know, I know what you say is true. There will be things that, that percolate to the surface over the next few decades um, from our experiences. But in the meantime, we are trying to make sense of it all and, um, and share it. And we would love for people to, to join us on our journey. And so our blog is called Five Backpacks.Family. Uh, I can get there, dot, 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 uh, five backpacks dot family. And I, at the risk of, you know, harping on the tone, our latest, uh, blog post that went out, uh, yesterday is about failing to, to summit a, uh, a mountain <laughs> and our, our 10 year, our 10 hour, uh, uh, odyssey of trying to make it to the top of the snow crusted mountain and, uh, 11, six, uh, 11,600 feet up in, uh, uh, Canada and failing miserably and crawling on our hands and knees and it was pretty bad. Yeah, it seems like we fail a lot. I know we do. We succeed at things too. <laughs> I like to think so. And someone else might might want to clue in because we we wrote a lot about before leaving and what it was like to to boil our possessions down to to five backpacks and uh, twelve square feet in a closet. We sold everything and donated everything. So if anyone's oh, looking, we, we, for- we missed this part. Yeah. If anyone, no. This so in my mind, you you know shuttered your house for. For this okay. time, this There's was no not yeah. selling everything and 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 literally living in a car, yeah. and, and then selling the car in Seattle at the end of this part. Yeah, we get to Seattle, uh, living out of our backpacks with our feet. Wow, yeah, five backpacks. That's the <laughs> five backpacks dot family. That's the which, which, by the way, that's a great domain name. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I, I'm a marketing consultant, and I don't usually recommend going outside of dot com, but that works. That works beautifully. Yeah, I love it. It's been fun. Thank you. And, um, yeah, so that's been part of the journey is realizing, you know, what, uh, you know, what's important and what's not important. What little we need to, to live our lives. Yeah. Effectively and wonderfully. The kids were so excited because I bought them new toothpaste because they were running out of toothpaste. They're like, really? You bought it for us? (laughs) Like, you're just, you know, we've lowered the bar so much. The expectations are so, so great. What was the hardest thing before we start to wrap up? What was the hardest thing for each of you to give up? Dining room table. I loved that dining room table. It weighed 400 pounds. It was solid wood. It was amazing. Best dining room table you could ever ask for. <laughs> what about you? Mine is so silly. <laughs> She's so- you know, I, I really enjoyed finding new homes for things, if that makes sense. I didn't realize that was going to be oh, such we spent a, a year, a joyful um, process. You know, almost a year getting rid of stuff by you know trying to gift it to people who would appreciate it. I was surprised at how attached I was to certain things. And so mine is, there are these goblets that Chris absolutely hated. I hate those goblets. Yeah. Um, they were these solid glass, all different colors. You know, they don't really they fit in the cupboard. Colors. And they're really molded and shaped in funny ways with flowers all over them. They were a wedding gift. But they rarely came out of the cupboard. So it was obvious Roughly that this is never. not something that we're going to keep. But as I passed them over to Goodwill, I just, my heart was sad. <laughs> such a silly one yeah. so yeah it's been it's been a, a process realizing just how um how tied we are to things and why kind of questioning and can can we let that go yeah absolutely now of course folks if you're listening we're going to have links to everything we've talked about today at whistlekick martial arts radio.com so if you're on a treadmill or driving a car please don't risk life and limb to to jot down all these these links and, and there are even more i mean you you shared some today, but you you already when you emailed me, you, you gave me even more. So we're gonna we're gonna have all of those over there. And I really appreciate you coming on. That this has been a fantastic conversation. And you've got me looking around my office right now, saying, "All right, 
how could I scale this down? What can I get rid of? It feels can really I go live in, in my car? I mean, it's, it's something I've long thought about, but, but you may have just kicked me over the edge. That's great. Um, I'd yeah. love to hear that. That's true. <laughs> share your journey. And of course, if I do that, everybody's going to know about it because, you know, it's what I do. But we ask all of our guests to, to kind of send us out with some, some parting words of wisdom. And I'd love to hear from both of you. I don't know how you're going to slice it up, but, you know, what, what would you share with everyone listening? Just kind of wrap up what we've been talking about today and, and send them off into the world. Sweep the leg. No, come on. So shoot, that doesn't count. Mm-mm. I just like to uh, assert that all of us have the the potential to reach our oh gosh I'm going to reuse my words have uh, have an opportunity in life to reach our highest potential and that we can be uh, a a model of you know like Holly said before of learning and integrity and service Um, that we can be all of those things and we can continue to cultivate those and learn and grow and um, as we're touching uh, touched on earlier that you know, martial arts isn't just for kids, it's for adults, that we can continue uh, at every age to continue to learn and grow um, and be the, the connected, independent self that, um, that we want to be. And I guess to tell that, in order to be that person, I think it's so important that we write down what it is that we want ourselves to be and continually reflect on how we're going to get there and whether or not we are on the path and then also reinventing as it becomes necessary because we don't, we don't want to be a static person, but uh, always changing and growing. I have to say the idea of selling everything or giving it away, packing up in a car and just driving to see where the world takes me is incredibly exciting. It's something that I've contemplated doing. It's something I would love to do. And I feel like I'm one step closer after listening to Shihan and Renchi today. I look forward to checking out their book and getting an update and hopefully bringing them back to talk to all of you. Hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly did. So Shihan, Renchi, thank you so much for coming on the show, for talking about your journey. And I look forward to checking in with you more in the future. If you want to find the show notes, you can head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we have photos and links to everything we talked about today. And of course, if you hit whistlekick.com, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on everything that we do, and maybe check out some of the other projects that we're involved in, like Marshall Journal, and well, there's more. I won't give you a list. I'll let you check it out. The best way to help us is actually not to make a purchase, but help us spread what we're doing. Tell friends, tell family about the show, about everything that we've got going on. If you know a martial artist, talk to them about Whistlekick. Help us grow, because then in turn, we can do more for you and for the martial arts community at large. Our social media is at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love your feedback. That's all I've got today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.